Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Rebecca Haig, CEO of the AIDS Action Committee of Massachusetts. AIDS Action is the state's leading provider of prevention and wellness services for people vulnerable to the HIV infection. Founded in 1983, AIDS Action provides services to one in six people in Massachusetts living with an HIV diagnosis. Rebecca has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The AIDS epidemic has gone through a very dramatic transformation over the last 30, 35 years. Right. Let's just describe the, the inception of AIDS, how AIDS came to our attention and some of the psychology surrounding AIDS, some of the, uh, the challenges surrounding AIDS. And, and let's quickly bring that to the present because that inception so informs how these organizations function today and the challenges that they face today as well. Oh, absolutely. We, um, many of us remember those early dark days, um, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, when people were dying of something that no one could even identify what was causing it. Um, it became known as the gay cancer, but we didn't know how it was transmitted. People were in fear of their lives. Um, and in many ways, the regular institutions uh, turned their back on gay men. Um, and in those days, it was a death sentence. And so the gay community, by and large, actually activated itself in some of the key metropolitan areas of San Francisco and Boston and New York, LA. And basically, most of our organizations were started in a small volunteer way where folks were just trying to collect information and pass it back to people, find out who was sick, see if they could get them to doctors, find out about research that was happening in another part of the country. But honestly, we set up a system in those days to comfort the dying. Uh, there was very little we could do for people other than really um, hold their hands, provide meals, make sure they were comfortable. Unable to do anything led to an anger that actually got generated into some real political power. Um, we got the FDA to speed up getting new drugs to the marketplace. Uh, we demanded that people be treated equally in our healthcare institutions. And it helped in some ways mobilize the gay community and politicize the gay community there were in court a very cases, positive way. There were court cases, right. protests, ACT UP. We had responses uh, by the, uh, the creation of organizations, by uh, fundraising uh, right. initiatives, um, a, a desire to have government actually recognize that that uh, citizens with AIDS deserved a government and and uh, private sector response. A absolutely, and in some ways, it brought people together. It was a sense of community, but we didn't really focus on building organizations. We just focused on getting as much resources as we could and helping those. Uh, who were in need. Yet organizations get built through they, this they evolved, chaotic. Right, they evolved, they're chaotic, but, but what, what we didn't think about is that we would need to exist for 30 years. In those days, if you remember, as awful as it was, there was also this hope that there would be a cure. Right. There was no sense that this would go on for 30 years. Science would solve it. That's right. And, and that had been our experience with all of these. You know, with the, we all went back to polio. My God, somebody so solved that problem. And really, as a result of that, um, all of us did what we could and created these volunteer-based organizations. And in fact, it was such a compelling disease. You could see people fa say, fading away. You could see lesions on their bodies. It was an outpouring of great community and resources, private resources particularly. And then, thank God, the drugs started to work. So about 10 years into the epidemic, 15 years, some of the early treatments were awful. Some right. people had more un uh, inability to tolerate those treatments, and their bodies were ravaged by the virus. But as time went on, we developed the co what people know now as the drug cocktail. cocktail which started actually working for people. It was not a cure, it simply managed their disease. It brought viral loads down, suppressed those viral loads so that people did not get uh, other infections. And we started to see people thriving, living on HIV and AIDS. You started seeing ads of men building muscle and feeling good about the idea they could live on this. But we never stopped transmitting the right. disease. Uh, for the last 15 years in our country, there have been 56,000 new infections 
every year and that hasn't 56, changed. 56,000 new, new infections. infections. But those who are affected, the, the demographic of those that have infected has shifted. It has, it's still majority gay. Still the, the, the more than half of the people who are contracting HIV and living with HIV are still gay. Or let's say they may not identify as gay but they're having sex with men. But 30% are women. It's a particularly disparate impact on the minority communities, immigrant communities. But I will say the great thing about Massachusetts is actually the curve is different here. In the last 10 years, we reduced new infections by 52%. And that has so much to do with what we have done as a state and what we've done as an organization. Once we realized the drugs were working, we had to convert our organization from an organization that served the dying to one that helped people live healthy, productive lives. And and incent behavior or, or educate be, uh, to behavior that would reduce vectors of transmission. Right. right, absolutely. Although what we found, which everybody confirms, is that behavioral interventions are really difficult. And here's, here's why we've succeeded in Massachusetts. Number one, we've offered medical services to people who are sick. So 15 years ago, we got HIV covered under our Medicaid plan. We were mm -hmm. the only state in the country that did this. And then seven years ago, we got health care reform so that people in Massachusetts are eligible for health care. The Affordable Care Act is based on the Massachusetts model. What that's meant is that people who had HIV had access to medical care and medications that have suppressed their viral load. They therefore do not pass along HIV, even if they behave in a risky way. Now, we still encourage condoms, safe sex. We've also done behavioral interventions that are really evidence-based, like needle exchange programs. Mm -hmm. And we've also done a pharmacy access program, which means you can legally go into any pharmacy in Massachusetts if you're 18 years of age and buy clean needles. So that means that as the, as the vectors of transmission shift from everyone to the people who are less well off, right. and then you suddenly start providing health care right. to people who are less well off, right. you're actually helping to rebalance the the equation as opposed to creating a circumstance where the people who are poor right. become those people who are affected in a cascading way by all the other uh, different issues, health right. and otherwise. Absolutely, that and, and that's really what aid service organizations have historically built, right? Support programs for people living with disease. Right. In the early years, everybody needed them because men who had worked for years could no longer work, had no source of income. Now what we do is provide nutritional supports via meals, housing supports for people who are homeless. We provide uh, medical adherence programs, mental health programs, substance abuse programs, all the things that those who live on the margin need if they're to manage their HIV. And that's a public health good in addition to helping that person live a, a healthy life. So let's talk about how the, the uh, aid services organizations and associated organizations have changed over the last 15, 20 years. Sure. First of all, 15 years ago, we all realized we had to have better infrastructure build some IT systems, have a strong finance, build development departments. Because so you're going to be around for a while. Because we were going to be around. So I think organizations became more sophisticated that way, particularly those early ones in places like Boston and New York and San Francisco mm -hmm. and LA. We had a good basis of support. But just as we realized we needed to go on, the private funding and public funding started to go down. Right. Because it, the crisis that everyone felt before was moving on, particularly internationally, and no one can take that away, that the crisis on Africa and India are in deserving of resources. So none of us begrudge that. We also begin to see this rise of new infections in the South, mm -hmm. and so there was a need to shift resources in our country. So at the same time that we kept getting more and more people living with HIV, the funding flattened out. And so what many of us have had to do is really try to use that infrastructure to leverage other services, get serve a broader population. We, for example, uh, provide services to people who are living with hepatitis C, which mm -hmm. is the next big silent epidemic coming along. Estimated in Massachusetts as many as 200,000 people living with hep, C. With, with hep C, which would be basically 20, 10 times more than people living with HIV. So we've decided we can serve a broader population. We've also merged 
many of us with smaller organizations. So at AIDS Action Committee of Massachusetts, we've done uh, three mergers in the last four years. Um, two with smaller organizations in which we absorbed their services into our infrastructure. We were able to cut their infrastructure and management cost, mm -hmm. preserving services. And we just announced a new strategic relationship with Fenway, Fenway Community Health right. because our belief is that the system we've created is the medical home model of the future. And this goes back to your origin, doesn't it? That's right. We started in the basement of the Fenway. So in some ways, it's come full circle. And we recognize that even as a $13 million organization, our viability long term is questionable unless we can find a way to fund this through the healthcare system. We've reduced new infections in Massachusetts, HIV infections, in, by 52%, so over half, just by the number of people that would have been infected with HIV, multiplied times the amount of money it would have taken to actually keep them alive with their HIV. You save $2.4 billion in healthcare costs. Now, what is the cost of that savings? It's an organization like Fenway, right. your organization, which is now merged, um, the costs of the various nonprofits, the annual costs, we might be talking about uh, in aggregate um, 50 to 50 million dollars, let's say. Right. To so there is a real cost there. There's a cost. But There's the a cost in supporting is, people. Is considerable. Absolutely. So it's and it is the basis for which we believe healthcare reform is the right answer, because if in fact what we need to do is move from a disease management to a prevention and wellness system, that's exactly what we've done in HIV. We're saying the issue is keep viral loads low, stop new transmission and help people live and get healthier outcomes. So we see fewer hospitalizations with clients that we support, fewer emergency room visits, increased adherence to their medication. All those principles would apply to heart disease, diabetes, and all the other chronic diseases that are out there. So we actually believe the model we have, combined with the medical capabilities at the Fenway, is an accountable care organization. Just leaving aside the human calculus, and we shouldn't do that, but, but let's do that for a moment. Just looking at the financial calculus, it is a co very compelling case. Absolutely, it's interesting you would raise it. I, before I came to, I've been at AIDS Action as the CEO for 10 years, but I spent 25 years in business. So I, I have an MBA, I, I'm not, uh, I was not schooled in HIV or social work. Or My approach to this all along has been, we have to get our messages out there and the key message here is we not only save lives, we save dollars. Yes, I work in AIDS because I want to save lives. But the way I'm going to do that is to convince people who care about the dollars that we also save dollars. And I think that's what we've become in terms of AIDS activists. We have to appeal to a broader audience. And the one thing that we still do is we still do a lot of political advocacy work. Why has this disease that we now know what causes it raged on for 30 years? Because it's about social, it's, it's at the vortex of all social justice issues. It's about homophobia, it's about sexism, it's about violence, it's about poverty, it's about them, not about us. And so we still, despite all our great successes, even in Massachusetts, face the I issue of stigma. If you talk to African American women in our office who have been coming in for years or active participants, you know, do peer support work, they will still say to you, I haven't told my sister that I have HIV. Why? I'm afraid she won't let me see her kids. That is still a stigma that, that this disease carries. And we have to understand that until we get at some of the root causes of that, we're probably, even with the medical advances, not going to end this epidemic. Does that require a high level of competence in marketing, communication, education, and is that part of the future of these organizations? As you shift your model and you're becoming more sophisticated, you're merging, you're thinking about overhead cost management, right. which is a heartless thing to do, but absolutely necessary to ensure that the maximum number of resources are directly uh, accessible by um, your, your clients, your constituents. Do you also have to up your game in other areas so that you are addressing problems that previously were at the margins but are now very, very prominent in, in how the future will be shaped surrounding AIDS? Absolutely. I mean, I think 
We have a marketing communications department. I would think every other major ASO, uh, particularly those the oldest, largest ones, do as well. Because we have had to become more focused on the market segments we're reaching. The people I need to reach about my services is a very different market segment right. than my major donors. So this is the, the sister of, uh, of, this, uh, exactly. of this woman. How do you reach that person? Because your, right. your marketing up till now, um, if, if you're typical of, of so many AIDS organizations right. across the country, the marketing up till this inflection point have, has been uh, in, in, in certain publications, on certain websites and so on, but this young woman's uh, sister right. may not be exposed to where your messages right. are appearing. Well, it's interesting. The meeting I just had before I came here is I went to the NAACP offices in Roxbury. And we're trying to engage the NAACP, which has a major initiative now, reaching out to faith-based organizations. So now you're talking co-op marketing. Well, yeah, absolutely. You need to develop leadership in the communities being most hit. So in the Cambodian community, in the Haitian community, in the Dominican re communities here, we've got to find leaders, leaders and leadership organizations that have built a trust with that community. We've been very comfortable dealing with the gay community, mm -hmm. by and large. Uh, we've been very comfortable dealing with the political community, with the business community. I think our challenge is to get to some of those communities most impacted and not carry the message as an aid service organization, but to get the local leaders to carry that message. And Phil Wilson, who runs the Black AIDS Institute, is being masterful at this. You know, he says AIDS is a black disease. He's saying if we as a community, as a black community, want to make a difference, we've got to tackle this issue. Phil Wilson can say that, Rebecca Head can't. And so part of this is we may be leaders of an organization, but our ability to be effective is to promote other leadership and to get them to take the lead on the issues that we think are important. And that requires, a, again, a very sophisticated approach to um, how these initiatives are paid for, the partnering agreements that comes out, uh, come out of it, how you negotiate mutual benefit with the a NAACP, uh, helping you to get your message out, but you're also helping them to get their message out across communities. It is, a, it is an approach that, that requires a increasing level of sophistication amongst your staff. Does that require you to, to shift some of the competencies and, and the structures? Absolutely, and that was one of the reasons for our um, strategic alliance with the Fenway, because they also have a communi communications group, so we can combine our skills, probably get broader economies of scale that way, mm -hmm. get more sophisticated uh, management. I, one of my approaches at AIDS Action has always been, I've managed to hire full uh, part-time people for what are traditionally full-time full positions. So I have a CIO that has other clients and is only part-time. My CFO was part-time for many years. The skill set to run an organization, even at $13 million, is so much more significant than it used to be. And in the private sector, you have the ability to recruit those people. It's a lot harder to ask people to take a significant cut in pay. Work in offices are not as attractive. And they're driven by the mission of it. So what I've been able to do is find people who can also make a decent salary, who, who usually give us a discount in what they're doing for us, but find real satisfaction in that work. Well, and we see this over and over again where we uh, recruited the head of uh, of uh, AIDS life cycle from The Gap, where we recruited uh, the chief counsel for um, Wikipedia uh, from um, eBay, yeah. where you have people who are in demand um, from the private sector, where compensation can be much higher, but the passion is really in the nonprofit sector. If you can make an arrangement so that the person has a sufficient income, um, their passions are, are exercised, they feel effective, they feel part of, of an energized community, you can attract some phenomenal talent. And those people can sometimes create an energy that is just transformational for us all. Oh, absolutely. I find that I've met really fascinating people by doing this and the ability to mobilize. People like yourself. Well, <laughs> I may or may not be fascinating, but uh, for me, it's been an incredible experience. Um, 
it's, it's in, I, meet, I also meet people I never would meet in my life. I, I get to hang out with women and men who come from various backgrounds that I normally would not be part of my sphere of influence. And I think it's really helped me understand more. Uh, several years ago, I um, had breast cancer and had to go through treatments for breast cancer. I was very lucky. I could keep my job. I had good health insurance. My 82-year-old mother flew up for my chemotherapy sessions. You know, I had an incredible support system. I have women in my office who are single moms living with HIV who have gone through exactly the same thing. It developed in me such a sense of what the, the strength of these people, their ability to not only survive but thrive and to take care of their families. And our ability as a society to offer opportunities for those people to do that is so critical. And that's what motivates me. I mean, what motivates me at the end of the day is can we end AIDS? But until we can end AIDS, it's our ability to impact individual lives that make a huge difference. And when I was head of human resources at a big advertising agency, we sold donuts. Uh, that, that's great, and we made lots of money, but I couldn't go home every day feeling like, you know what, I made a big difference in somebody's life today. And I can tell people who work in the private sector there's no feeling like it, there's no better high, there's nothing else you could want more than to be going home in a day knowing that somebody got saved. Rebecca Haig, thank you so much for sharing these stories with us. Thank, thank you, you so much for keeping these organizations strong and thank you for your insights. Thank you very much.